All right, there's another very nice uh, paper three calculus prep from a school. So let's have a look at the nice problems, okay, how they are preparing, and how we can actually benefit from great materials like this. Uh, so the question goes like this. So uh, they introduce this hyperbolic cosine and sine. And yes, for paper three, it's definitely okay to introduce you a new function because it's considered as a learning phase. So you learn new functions and what you need to do is so you need to execute what you have learned uh, from this new phase for the proving phase. So you need to talk about, you need to remember two things, the learning phase and proving phase. So, you know, I want you to pause the video and then have a look at the, and see yourself, you can try them first before you decide a uh, commentary, okay? Sure, so hyperbolic function sine and cosine are defined as the following. It's called shine and cosh. You can read it out different, it doesn't really matter, but it's a mixture of the uh, the exponential and trigonometric identity. So, so what you can show here is another derivative rules, differentiation rules of the hyperbolic sine and cosine. Now, what I like to do is just to Form the little differentiation using the chain rule on the hyperbolic sign. So as you can see, you just you just have to differentiate one by one, and for the chain rule of e to the power negative x, it would be negative e to the power negative x. And if you actually add them up together, it can uh, show you the hyperbolic cosine. And so vice versa, you can actually do the same thing with the hyperbolic cosine and show yourself, uh, uh, see yourself that you are able to find those derivatives. Okay, let's have a look at the integration one. So so here they are, they have given me the integration by substitution one. So e even if if I wasn't given even those hyperbolic sign, well, uh, my typical uh, substitution would have been with the tangent actually. But let's use the x equal to hyperbolic sign. And uh, as you can see, uh, we can use square root of 1 plus x squared being the 1 plus sine hyperbolic sign uh, square. And it's very similar to, in fact, the trigonometric identity, the Pythagorean identity. And it comes off as this. So we can use the uh, dx as the hyperbolic cosine times d theta. And then uh, then you can uh, describe all the integral in terms of the theta. So it becomes like that. And obviously, the integral of one will be just simply the the variable theta here, where I can use the inverse sine. So in fact, it is it comes off as the inverse hyperbolic sine function. So that was a part B. And for part C, you know, before you actually attempt this, and you know, I want you to uh, try yourself first. You know, what technique would you like to do? Uh, very good. What I like to do here is that it's a product of the polynomial and hyperbolic sign. So what I like to do is by parts. So using the integration by parts, we will ha we should have, uh, you know, I'm going to differentiate, by the way, the x squared because that's the very typical one, right? And if you differentiate once, it becomes linear. It's not reduced enough. So we're going to perform the integration by parts again. For the second term, hopefully if I differentiate the x, I get simply just the one having this integral, right? So then we can solve it in all together, uh, having this final, final form of the integral of the x square and then hyperbolic sine. As you can see, it's, it's usually performed by the parts twice. Okay. Sure, and then uh, what we had to show, uh, what we had to do is again, this is this is typical learning phase. You learn a new function hyperbolic tangent, which is the uh, the ratio of the hyperbolic sine and cosine, for which we can use the rule the, the identity that we have learned. And here they have asked me to use the uh, find the inverse function. So what we can do is just interchange x and y to the given form, and then rearrange a bit, right? So then uh, I'm gonna uh, regroup by the e to the power of two y because that's the term that's only in terms of y. So that's lovely. So then you can. Uh, uh, rearrange again. If you rearrange, it becomes like that. Then if I group by the negative one on the right hand side and then divide by the x minus one, I can simply clean e to the power two y. But I will put that negative in the denominator just to make it more aesthetic, right? It's coherent with the positive one. And if we, if you use the logarithms, then you can you can you can have the inverse form of the exponential as the logarithm with the base the logarithms of the base of e, and then the y becomes half of the log of 1 plus x over 1 minus x. That's great. So that's the, what is the inverse hyperbolic tangent, okay? So that's lovely. So from here, uh, what you can do is to, what, they, what the question asks you to actually is to differentiate and use it for the integral of 1 over 1 minus x squared. And yeah, you know, actually, 1 over 1 minus x squared could have been just integrated by using the uh, partial fraction, the one that we know, you know, 1 over a, b is uh, equal to 1 over b minus a times is 1 over a minus 1 over b but for here they're trying to you know give you some different approach of the integral even for the same integral introduced with the uh, different types of function you can actually express it more simply right so here yeah you know if you differentiate this with the logarithm form of the inverse hyperbolic tangent then as you can see it's just logarithms and inside if it's got a uh, quotient then i'll probably use the subtraction rule here and as you can see it can come up as the uh, rational form for the derivative and you just have to differentiate that you just have to combine 
combine them together. And as you can see, then the derivative of that is 1 over 1 squared. So using the fundamental theorem of calculus, the antiderivative of that will go back to the inverse tangent here. So inverse uh, hyperbolic tangent, that's what we have. And you can obviously use it for the, uh, the definite integral. So you know, I'll leave it as an exercise for you to uh, evaluate. So a very lovely problem, very lovely, uh, very lovely exercise from the school. So it's always, in, always amazing to see uh, some of the nice questions from school. Okay, let's have a look at the uh, the second part of uh, uh, the exercise where he was using the uh, the uh, gamma function. So they have asked me to work with the uh, uh, integral of the log, which is done by parts, right? That would be the product of the logarithmic function and one and into by parts formula. So it's trivial. It's okay. And then what they have asked me to do is to actually the rule of the uh, log and factorial is bigger than that identity. So what you have to do was in fact, you know, compare it by the area under the curve and then the right sum, right? For the increasing function, my friend, for the increasing function, please remember that the right sum is actually bigger. Okay. So, you know, for by parts, we already have derived it. And if we simply use it, we can get that form. And that's not a problem. And then area rectangle from 1 to n using the right sum. Remember, this is the right sum, uh, the, the height from the right value of the x of that width will be uh, giving you the upper value, upper bound. So it's in a, by using the additive property of the logarithm, uh, combine them all together, which then is represented by, by the factor, factorial. And clear, clearly, the right sum is upper bound for increasing, right? So hence, we can have this ln n factorial is bigger than n times ln n minus n plus 1, which you can simplify further as such. So yeah, that was the first part of the problem, which is also a very nice paper theory problem, because uh, you may not have seen this on before, but they have given you a nice illustration and enough hints for you to work with learning phase, hence you can proving phase. Okay, the next part was actually to prove the gamma function by the induction. So let's get to it. So if we if we try with the n equal to zero for this one, they have uh, they have said that that the basic step should be n equal to zero. It doesn't necessarily have to be always the positive integer, so it's okay. So let's do it. So for that one, it's, in, it's working with the improper integral, so you need to be able to evaluate with infinity for the upper bound here, uh, but no problem, the exponential decay function will go to zero. If you put x equal to zero for this one, it becomes just a one, hence the difference of that will be becoming uh, the one here. So it's same as one factorial, the basic step works. And what's the next step that I have to do with the induction? Yes, you, you're basically right. So we need to go with the induction hypothesis implies about the proof. So let's see. So suppose n equal to k true. So that's my inductive hypothesis. So I don't have to prove it because I already assumed this to be true. But I need to show that the next brick is going to follow the rule. It doesn't necessarily have to be true. I have to show that. And here, you know, what technique of integration would you like to do? And that's lovely. I like to do it by parts because it's the product of the polynomial and expert. So if we differentiate the polynomial, we get the following form here. And what we need to do is to actually evaluate the defi improper definite integral of the first term going from 0 to infinity. And uh, for the evaluation of the limit for the infinity, what you can do is to lop it all, k plus 1 many times and showing you that it's a 0. But that's quite obvious because, as you know, whatever the power of the polynomial, we know that the exponential is a lot more uh, faster decaying, so it should become 0. But you can show it by lop it all many times. And then the, uh, for the second one, evaluating x equal to 0 will result in 0, so no problem because it's a product of the x, no problem. And then what we have to do is to move on to the second part. But I, I so, so this one is what's the leftover. But I want you to realize the x to the power of k to the power of negative x improper integral from 0 to infinity is in fact precisely our induction hypothesis. So I can actually replace that by the k factorial. And using the recursive relation of the factorial, it can be preserved as the k plus 1 factorial. Hence, the uh, you can uh, continue with the inductive conclusion that the basic step n equal to 0 works. And assuming n equal to k true implied n equal to one true so our integral must be true so my, my point here is another very lovely problem from school okay from a school and uh you know that's how they are practicing right now so you shouldn't just work on the basic questions from the paper one and paper two you should really delve into like the hardcore questions of the paper three which is usually categorized by two things it's often that you're gonna it's it's often that you don't see the problems that uh, you already have done before it's gonna be very new uh, it's called the learning phase and after you acquire this acquire those techniques you are willing to apply to the next problem which is going to be an another unique problem which is going to be very difficult to solve unless you apply the rules that you already have from the phase so make sure you are keen on learning the learning phase as well as the proving phase but yeah that's pretty much it for me today i will see you next time